when we talk about robots, uh, all sorts of images come to people's minds, right? So they're the machines that want to wipe every human being off the planet. Uh, they're kind of sort of cuddly, cute, but somewhat annoying uh, characters from, from movies. And also then people think about those orange machines that work in car factories and just kind of do this 24 by 7. All right, so they're all sort of valid ideas about what robots, robots are. But what I want to do today is paint you sort of the big picture of, of what robots really are and you know, sort of the cutting edge of what robots can do. I don't know anything about your business, but I thought if I just give you enough kind of examples of what robots could do, then maybe you'd say, yeah, I, I could use this kind of robot for this kind of problem. So I'm not trying to second guess what you do, just trying to paint the really big picture and uh, having to take questions and, uh, as, as we go along. So the fundamental question, lots of people ask what's a robot, and there are lots of very boring, dry definitions of robots that really aren't very helpful at all. So I'm going to give you some of my definitions. So one is, it's a word from a play, actually. There's a play written in 1920 by this uh, Czech playwright, Karl Čapek, uh, and the word means forced labour. Uh, it's got some connotations about hard work, drudgery, even slavery to, to some extent. Uh, so this play was written in 1920, and the plot actually would not be at all surprising to you. Human beings create robots because they're sick of doing hard work. Robots get jack of that, rise up and kill all the humans. Right? So we just keep having the same story over and over again right? with better, uh, better computer graphics and effects. It's the same story. Uh, it's nearly a hundred years old, which is kind of sad. Uh, other thing people think of robots as super intelligent machines. Uh, these guys out, out of Star Wars from a long time ago now, uh, you can speak a gazillion languages, you know, you can put out fires, fix X-wing fighters, all of that stuff, right? So we have this image of robots being super intelligent, they can do all sorts of amazing functions. The problem is that that really doesn't exist. It absolutely is fiction. And certainly in 1977, uh, this was done by actors in shiny suits. Right? So a short guy, Kenny Baker, inside of R2-D2, Anthony Daniels, an English actor, inside c 3 uh, These days, they're probably remotely operated machines, but they are not intelligent machines. Right? It's, a, it's a total fraud. Right? It's either a human being inside, or it's someone sitting off, off stage with some joysticks making the robots. I'm sorry. Aww. And you won't get to you won't come see the new movie. I'm not seeing the new one. Right. <laughs> and this is the other sort of definition of robots. You know, it's the tireless factory worker, and this is the uh, line, fairly modern robot line in California, which is building Tesla electric cars. So this line's you know, pretty new, state-of-the-art robot technology. And what you can pick up from this is the, these robots are very strong, very fast, and uh, they're also incredibly accurate. So it looks very, very graceful what's going on here. It's really sort of poetry in motion uh, as these robots are working cooperatively to build the cars. <coughs> what's interesting about all these robots, come back to the point I made right at the beginning, these robots are blind, right? They have no idea where anything is in their environment, but they know that if they go to this particular coordinate in space and close their gripper, they're gonna pick up the side of a car. And then they move it to this coordinate and let it go and it will, it will mate with the car, right? So it's all done by accurate geometry. So an incredible amount of, of, of design goes into creating one of these factories. And the big problem with these factories is when you want to change the product you make, you've got to do a lot of reprogramming of all your robots, you've got to re-engineer all the jigs and fixes, things that hold everything in place so that these blind robots can thrive. So that's uh, the problem with modern day robots. This particular technology is actually, come on, very old. Uh, 60 years old now, a uh, little startup in Connecticut, uh, founded in 1956. Their first robot went into service in 61, unload, unloading die casting machines at a General Motors plant. So this guy, George Deval, was, uh, was the inventor, and this guy, Joe Engelberger, was the entrepreneur, the guy in the bow tie, and he just proselytized robots. He pushed them everywhere. He was on the Johnny Carson show, he had robots playing golf and pouring beer and all of this stuff. Uh, he was tireless in, uh, boosting the, in boosting the technology. So there's a bunch of robot companies around today that you see building cars. The technology is a direct descendant of what these guys did back a long, long time ago. This company no longer exists. 
So a definition I like for robots is it's a machine that moves stuff from A to B. So a common thing for a robot is picking up a box off a conveyor belt and putting it in another box. A bigger robot picks up the box and puts them on a pallet. Even a bigger robot picks up pallets and puts them on trucks. Yeah? Uh, robots pick up chips and put them on circuit boards. Uh, these are the sorts of things that, that robots do well. So just think of it as a machine that moves stuff 24 by 7 without, it, without complaining, doesn't need lights on, stuff reliably from A to B. Uh, this is an example of a, a kind of descendant of that uh, manufacturing robot. Uh, Dave Baxter is demonstrating a very simple method for holding And this is pretty tedious. <laughs> well, what it's going to do, it's a two-armed industrial robot. This is a pretty new technology, this Baxter robot. We've got one in our lab. Uh, and it's trying to deal with flexible material, which is really, really challenging. And if you watch it for long enough, you will see that it does some sort of impression of, uh, of falling folding a shirt. Uh, you know one of those things that Sheldon has on Big Bang Theory, put your shirt in, close all the flaps. Okay, so that's a modern version of a manufacturing robot, relatively low cost. This machine costs 20, 22,000 bucks, got two arms, and the idea is that it replaces uh, manual labor for low accuracy jobs, so picking up things in a, in a, off a conveyor belt, doing some very rudimentary assembly. You could buy a robot like this and train it just by grabbing its hand and saying, this is a thing that I think you need, that you need to pick up. And you grab it by the hand and show, this is the thing, and when you see a thing, what I want you to do is to go over here. And so you don't write any code, you don't program it, you demonstrate what needs to be done by showing it things and moving its hand around. So then uh, they don't have to be arm robots. More modern robots have got wheels and they can move around the environment. So uh, a robotic uh, pallet truck you know, can pick up a pallet and put it into another location. And then you can do this on a very large scale. Uh, this is a container port and there are robot systems now that pick containers up from the quayside, put them in a stack, take them off the stacks and put them onto a truck. So Port of Brisbane, the Asiano terminal there, uh, has got a large number of big robot vehicles that tool around and move, uh, move, uh, move containers about. Uh, it was an Australian development built out of the University of Sydney in conjunction with a big Finnish uh, uh, manufacturer, what they call straddle carriers, which are the machines that move uh, containers about. Okay, anyone ever bought anything from Amazon? Yeah? yeah. No, I have to go to the website, click some stuff, while later it comes in a box. Ask yourself the question, how does the stuff get in the box? Right? They've got a lot of product. So you imagine how big their warehouse is. So you, your order comes in, some guy picks up an empty box and starts walking, and maybe by late in the afternoon, you know, he's back uh, with your order. You know, it, just, it just doesn't work, uh, it, it won't scale. So the only reason Amazon was able to grow uh, was by introducing robot technology. So what happens in an Amazon fulfillment center is there are all these shelves, the blue units are shelves that hold a single product. And the orange things underneath are robots. So the robots go around and they basically jack up, lift up a blue shelf and bring it to a guy who's doing dispatching. So there are more shelves than there are robots, right? So the shelves are all just sitting there, packed in really tightly, the robots scuttle in underneath, pick up a shelf uh, that's got a product that's of interest and they bring it to the guy who's doing the dispatching. Uh, so then you see all the shelves in motion. So if you ordered something, uh, you ordered f uh, three things from Amazon, uh, the guy who's filling your order, he takes an empty box, and the sh first shelf comes past, he takes off the first item, puts it in the box, the next shelf comes past, he takes off the second, and then the third item puts it in the box, and he's done. Right? He doesn't move at all. The shelves come to him in exactly the right order. So tens of thousands of shelves, uh, thousands of robots going around and bringing stuff to the dispatchers in the order in which they need it. Amazon couldn't function if it didn't have these robots. Okay, so take home message, right? Robots and machines move stuff from A to B. Could be an arm, could be on wheels, could be whatever, right? That's what they, that's what they do. Self-driving cars, most people have heard about Google cars. It really all started off in this competition in 2007, uh, run by DARPA, uh, American Military Advanced Research Agency and a whole bunch of pretty strange looking cars competed. And they had to do things like uh, parking, uh, they had to be able to follow the rules of the road, they had to be able to do the right things at intersections. Uh, but they basically demonstrated the rudimentary capabilities that you need to drive on the road. 
that technology has been refined. So this is what a Google car looks like, you know, as of as of last year. So this gentleman is going to hop into a Google car, and it's going to take him. It's going to take him for a drive, and he doesn't have his hands on the wheel. Doesn't have to push the pedals. Uh, just going to take him where he wants to go. So a lot of people are saying this is the future of uh, of of transport. If you don't drive a car anymore, you have a mobility pod. You tell it where you want to go, and it takes you there. The next generation of these cars don't have steering wheels or pedals. Uh, it's like a naughty car. You, know, you just hop in, tell it where you want to go. You know, read a book, do your email, whatever it is you want to do. You know, the task of driving, which human beings have done for for a hundred years or a bit more, uh, you know, it's, it's going to disappear. And uh, he looks he looks pretty comfortable. It's something I think it'll take a bit of getting used to. Going around in a car and not driving, uh, it's coming. Absolutely, it's coming. It's not just Google. All the main car manufacturers are pushing self-driving cars, and the reason pretty clear: a million people a year killed uh, by human beings uh, wielding cars. Probably 100 million people injured by people wielding cars. People, human beings are just shocking drivers. They shouldn't be allowed to drive cars. Uh, so robotics, I think, really is the right thing to to do. Okay, so people have been also thinking about other modes of mobility. I like this little guy, little dog, it's a robot, it's about this big. And this was again another DARPA funded project. And they were looking at how you move over very rough terrain using legs. And this was a lot, uh, the motivation really came when they were looking for people that they didn't like in rocky terrain in Afghanistan. And you know, jeeps don't work there, hum hummers don't work there. So how could you build robots that could uh, walk over very rough mountainous terrain? So Little Dog was a platform that was used to do a lot of uh, really quite advanced research in how you plan where the, the feet of these things should go. And you can see it, it can do some, some pretty amazing things. The company that built uh, Little Dog, you can see there he's, he, he slipped, but he will, he will adapt uh, and, and, and pick himself up. This is a probably much better known robot. There's lots of spoofs of this robot. It's called Big Dog. Uh, and it's an amazing platform, again, built by the US military to act as a sort of robotic mule to carry uh, material, large amounts of weight for Marines over very rough terrain. And here you can see it working under some pretty adverse uh, conditions like being on black ice and being kicked in the side. Uh, so pretty pretty impressive piece of, piece of robotics. So, this is uh, the, the, one of the later things from Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics got bought by Google earlier this year. It's got a crazy thing called Wildcat, and the idea of this machine is to go very, very quickly. Uh, it doesn't go as, the, the goal is to go as fast as a cheetah, uh, but at the moment it doesn't go as fast as a cheetah. It goes faster than Usain Bolt now, which is, which is not bad. Uh, so it's just getting a bit of a run up, and you'll see it uh, get, get moving. And it looks completely mad. But you think about what's going on here, coordinating the motion of the legs, maintaining a sense of balance and, and all of that. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great piece of engineering. So what I'm doing here is just painting you a big picture of what robots can do, right? Just to get away from those ideas you have from Star Wars or the orange robots that build cars. Can I ask a question? Sure. How are these things powered? Because, you know, like the ones in the factory, obviously, they're like, they're electricity. Correct, they're electric. But how are these ones powered? How long will the power last for? You hear the irritating noise that it's making. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, so it's got a petrol engine on board uh, with, a hydraulic, with a hydraulic compressor. And <laughs> the only way you can get the strength to weight ratio in this thing is to be hydraulically actuated. So it's all hydraulics uh, with a petrol power compressor. This is another kind of, this is a really interesting little robot down here called Rex. And uh, you, you'll see what he can do in a minute. This was inspired by the design of cockroaches. Uh, and this can move over really rough terrain, but without being clever like a little dog was. This guy's just got like six flexible legs, and it's like it's just flailing the ground. But by flailing the ground in the right sort of way, it can go over very rough terrain, and it can do crazy things like jumping, uh, using these curved, flexible legs. And, uh, So it sort of made a, a best of Rex reel here. Uh, there's an underwater version where they took off those curved legs and just put little blades on it, and then it can swim. 
uh, you know, it can swim in a straight line. It can also hover, so you know, it can move. It can move in any direction or, or stay still. And uh, so this machine is sort of almost amphibious. So here you can see it's just going over really rough, rough rocks. It doesn't know anything about the rocks. It just moves its legs, and if it does that enough, it will uh, it will go forward. Uh, here it's going into a drain where there's some water. So it can sort of go over rough terrain, swim a bit. Uh, it, it really is probably the the best sort of robot design, I think, for going over really rough terrain uh, and also through water or over, or over water. Like a 60 TV camera on it? Yeah. So, <laughs> there's Rex sloshing around in the, in the drain. Okay, enough Rex. People have also been building humanoid robots for a long time. Uh, Asimo robot was released, the first version was released in the year 2000 uh, by Honda. You can see that they're very short. The reason to make them short is it's so they're not too threatening to human beings. It kind of towers over you, you'd be pretty intimidated by it. And over the years, it's gotten increased levels of capability. Uh, and here you can see it jumping. Uh, not a very big jump, but didn't used to be able to jump at all. And you know, people were saying, thinking about what these robots might be used for, and people were thinking about using them for, for home help, for keeping people in their homes longer if they've got a, a mechanical uh, person, uh, assistant, if you like, to, to look after them. So there you saw it doing a, a reasonably dexterous task, you know, unscrewing the, the lid of the, of the bottle and now it will, it will do some pouring. Not everything in this robot is completely automatic. A lot of it's sort of scripted, might be a person off, off over here somewhere saying, you know, now unscrew the bottle, you know, now do a pouring action. Uh, but a lot of the actual things like grabbing something and turning it is done automatically. Someone's not actually joysticking that. Someone's saying at a higher level, do this task next. Uh, these machines are not commercially available. Uh, they're very complex, but you know, over, over time, <coughs> the price of these things could come, you know, come down to something like a, like a high-end car. I think the price would be a sort of logical price point. Here's a couple of other of humanoid robots. This is a Chinese university. They're playing ping pong. So what's interesting here is these robots are actually using a sense of vision. So they've each got two eyes, so they can use that to triangulate the path of the ball in real time as it's coming towards it, and then plan how the how the paddle should come out and intersect the ball and knock it back over the over the net. So it doesn't play very aggressive uh, ping pong. Uh, it can play very long and, and boring rallies uh, <laughs> with, uh, with robotic precision. Uh, but yeah, in terms of what's going on here under under the hood, it looks kind of, it looks almost trivial. But there's a lot, <coughs> an awful lot going on. The robots are perceiving. They are actually doing some limited seeing and co and some limited hand eye coordination. A bit of strategy. Another really interesting aspect of, of robotics, something that actually become commercial recently. Military people have been looking at this for a long time, what are called exoskeletons. So this is something that you wear. And it is robotic. Uh, it's got actuators and motors in here and straps around you and it allows you to carry uh, bigger weights, uh, maybe run faster, go faster without getting tired. Because although you're commanding it, the hard work is being done by those motors which are attached to your joints. So I filmed this at an at a exhibition in Japan last year. So the guy on the, on the left is wearing the exoskeleton and his mate's loading him, loading him up with heavy things. And uh, he finds it quite, quite easy, to, easy to carry that. He's got one bag, and he'll give him another one in a minute. <laughs> so this is you know, as a way of giving people, people strength. Uh, and the intelligence is all in the human, right? The, you know, the human's got the intelligence and can understand what's going on and do the task, uh, but the hard work's done by, done by the robotic part. Probably heard a lot about drones. Uh, drones are always in the news. Uh, Most of people misusing drones, flying them where they shouldn't do. Uh, basically, they're very simple machines. You can buy them from toy shops for you know, hundreds of dollars, strap a GoPro on, and you can get amazing imagery from places Otherwise, it'd be really hard to go to. You have to put you know, people on ladders or rappel down on ropes. It's expensive. Uh, this is a bit of uh, video <laughs> taken uh, of a German tourist who came to the Gold Coast. Now, this is totally illegal. You shouldn't do this. Uh, and he flew up and up and over the Seoul building. And just get an idea of the sort of gorgeous footage you get. 
And this would be really, really hard to get otherwise. And this is with a few hundred bucks worth of kit. He can take, take pictures like this. You're not allowed to do this casserole uh, so we we laugh. We've lived that experience? Yep. <laughs> so we, we promoted it on the news. We've got a drone that um, might yep. go through the flying. We've trolled it on our reservoir. Yep. Yeah, and then we got phone call after phone call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like the ca cats are in a, in a difficult spot. They can't put the genie uh, back in the <laughs> bottle that's out. Uh, the machines are there. Uh, we'd we, we phone them up and ask them what was the best phone. And, oh, the person's down like this. Don't worry, you'll be right down here. Yeah. Why? And then all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, one news article and it was like all these other drone companies yeah. running up and saying why don't they, why don't they license what we have. Yeah. So you're supposed to keep them under 400 feet and you should apply them in populous areas, which is the main major crime here. Uh, but the other sticking point is commercial use versus hobby use. Mm. Yeah. As, a, as a hobbyist, you can use them as long as you stay under 400 feet and have the owner's permission yep. to be doing it where you're doing it. Commercial, you have to have a almost a private pilot license. Well, you have to, yes. Yeah, so you need a remote, what they call a remote pilot license. <laughs> so you go to a safety management plan yeah. for each site. You said at the moment we're looking to train up three operators. Yeah, I mean, it's a regional setup. Pretty really interesting point. The CASA, because they've been looking after airplanes for 100 years or whatever it is, they absolutely they're thinking it's all about pilots, right? So you have a pilot in an aeroplane, that's fine. They call this a remote piloted aircraft. So there is still a pilot. So the idea of a machine that flies all by itself, they don't understand that. There's gotta be a pilot, right? Their whole mindset is there's gotta be a pilot. So you call him a remote pilot, he's just not sitting in the aircraft. And because he's a pilot, then of course he has to be regulated and licensed. And that's the way they come at, at this problem. Well, even, even uh, <coughs> model aircraft that um, home hobby, oh, no, no. Use, mm. the RC guys use, they are aircraft, they're just a tad of delegated the authority for regulating what happens with them to aircraft the, clubs. the Australian Model uh, Association. Yeah. Um, so but we, as soon as you move outside of hobby, you move away from AMA's delegation to what category is <coughs> aircraft as well. Mm. So that's my commercial thing. Because people will be using these things for commercial purposes. So you guys are getting, getting, getting licensed. We're looking at getting licensed now, yeah. Okay. So yeah, we've got a couple of people out in the field who've got licenses, and then we've got people who want to upskill. Yeah. So that's if you're interested. Yeah. I want to get more about. It. All right. This is some uh, sort of dynamic activities done by these uh, these flying vehicles. Uh, so here you see, basically, it's a flying tennis racket, and uh, yeah, there's two of them doing some doing some juggling. So they are incredibly agile. Uh, these are not being flown by people. These are these are these are truly robotic, flying in a big walled off area. But just to give you some idea of the dynamic capabilities of, of, of this class of machine, they're, they're pretty phenomenal. And this is speeded up four times. Uh, so people are starting to look at what other things could you do with this? Could you actually do construction or repair? So this is a big demo I was done uh, at EDH in, in Zurich where they actually built this very big structure out of very, very lightweight bricks. Uh, argue whether this is useful or not, but it sort of demonstrates a capability. And it's a bit, they look a bit like wasps is coming and putting down a little bit of, little bit of wasp, a mud and going off and, like a mud wasp. Uh, and they're going off and yeah, grabbing, grabbing more bricks and, and, popping them, and popping them down. And here's another example. Here you've got a bunch of them cooperatively carrying a big structure. So you think instead of craning stuff up a height, you just strap on a whole bunch of flying machines and, and take it up there. So there's whole different ways of thinking about material transport issues uh, than we're used to. So if I leave you with yeah, any kind of message, you know, think very loudly about the way you move stuff around in the environment. This is, a, this is one I really like. Uh, this is quite recent work. This is a, a, another one of these flying machines with a uh, water collection system. So it's got six water vials. And uh, what they do is uh, they take off and they do water sampling. So no more men in boats, right? Take quad rotor out there and you can take up to, you know, this, this machine, six independent water samples. Slurp it up and put it in a bottle, bring it home. What's that? No, uh, only it's just got a long tube that goes down to the water. 
Yeah, because you don't want to really get the surface water sample. You want to get. Okay, let's go. Let's go and look at this movie again. Because we've got an application for that. Because we have reservoirs we keep water. We want to know what the quality of the water is. I thought you might have water. I thought you might have water. So I'm not sure if you can see that. Yeah, sample underneath. The, the tube looked like it was about five, four, four or five meters long. Um, so here's an underwater robot. This is a commercial uh, tethered underwater robot. So this, uh, it's been controlled by an operator through a fiber optic, fi through a fiber optic link. And this machine is incredibly maneuverable. Uh, it's got ca camera in the camera in the front. Uh, so this is a little uh, startup again, Swiss. So a, a company called Hydromere uh, just just launched this. So robots move stuff from A to B, right? That, that's what you need to know. And they move themselves from A to B, or they can move other things from from A to B. If they can fly it, they can swim it, uh, whatever. So yeah. So this is some work at MIT, and this is uh, kind of. A, Franken forklift, uh, <laughs> but it's intelligent. So the guy shouts a command, comes to receiving, and it does. It knows what receiving is, it's got a map. It can understand natural language and human speech. You can point to it and say, I want you to take that pallet, put it on that trunk over there, and it does. So it, it takes off. And you can see that it's bristling with all kinds of sensors and whatever. It looked like those early self-driving cars did. But you know, in a few years, as the technology gets smaller, uh, uh, and and computers get more powerful, uh, you'd be able to put that in your little box on the, on the back of the forklift. So the machines you know, have all sorts of different motion modalities. They can fly, they can swim, they've got wheels, but they're also going to have increasing level of intelligence and the ability to interact with human beings by voice or by, or by gesture, which is the way we communicate with each other. So exa example again, this is what that robot car looked like in 2007. Uh, 2012, 2014, this is the latest Google car. So you can see over just uh, six years, the evolution from crazy looking thing to something that looks quite polished, same thing would happen, say, to the intelligent forklift truck. So for robots to work in the sort of complex environments where we work, not in a factory, they need to be able to create maps of their world as they go about their business. So this is a robot that we've had running around the QT bookshop for, uh, uh, second semester of last year, and as it goes around, it builds a map that looks like this. So a grey square is where it can't drive, and a white square is where it can drive, what we call free space. So we just put it in the bookshop and let it rip, and it builds this map. So we can see different sorts of bookshelves, people, uh, things that are transient and don't appear in the map, but we can see the walls and the general structure of, of the bookshop. And this is interesting because if a pallet of books comes down, gets, gets inserted, then it appears in the map if it sees it enough times, and if it disappears, it doesn't see it for a while and thinks, okay, that thing doesn't exist anymore. So robots are actually able to build quite accurate geometric maps of their environment. This is a two-dimensional map because this is a two-dimensional robot that runs around the floor, but people are also doing this with uh, these drones, these quad rotors, where right? you can build three-dimensional volumetric maps of environments uh, from, a, from a robot platform. Uh, that's the robot uh, in, in the bookshop. In the bookshop. Okay, uh, this is some work that we've been doing at QT, this is what I'm going to finish up on, uh, doing some work in agricultural robotics. So this is a robot that we built and it's uh, based on a little John Deere data vehicle. We've got a more sophisticated looking follow-up vehicle. And what it's doing is actually using a sense of vision. It's got a bunch of cameras uh, and some lights for night time. And it can actually follow the, oh, why that's not playing. It can actually follow the crop rows. So it doesn't need a super accurate GPS or anything like that to follow the crop rows. You know, you want to be within a few centimeters uh, and that kind of GPS accuracy is expensive. Uh, so it actually uses cameras and you can just see the crop row. Here, this is just, uh, this is just stubble from last year's season. Uh, whether it's stubble or, or young crop, uh, it can, if there's any kind of hint of a row there, uh, it will see it and follow it just using a, a fairly rudimentary sense of vision, like we would do if we were driving the vehicle ourselves. Uh, another one, again, just using cameras, uh, and there's Dave, its creator, 
and I can see Dave, uh, and that does the right thing and, uh, and moves and drives around him. Uh, again, just using a sense of just using a sense of vision. And the good thing about vision, and the reason that we uh, keep going on about it, is we know that there's a whole bunch of complex tasks that we do every day without thinking about that we use vision for. If we don't have vision, if we're blind, you know, we're profoundly impaired. So we believe you know, that's why robots need to be able to see. And the other thing is a technological one is that cameras are incredibly cheap. So you know this device has got two cameras in it and they probably only cost a buck each. Uh, you need a bit of computing to process the data that comes out of the cameras, but the computers are pretty cheap as well. I mean the parts cost of this thing is about the, about five percent of what you pay for it. So you know it's uh, it's it's the it's the way to go is to try and mimic this uh, biological sense of vision. Uh, some other work that we, we've done at QT, uh, flying an, aerial, an unmanned aerial vehicle, in this case a fixed wing over an environment, uh, build a photo mosaic, but we can do it in a full 3D reconstruction uh, of, the, of the environment that we, that we flew over. Fly over once, take a bunch of pictures, and bang out the three-dimensional geometry. <coughs> this is some work one of my colleagues, um, Matt Dunbabin, has been doing, and what he's been doing is putting a smart boat on, on water storages, and then stuff on a live and home little meringue. And what this boat's doing uh, is a couple of things. It's got some sensors uh, on board that can measure the structure. So what this is doing, what you're seeing here, it's a little, little difficult to see, it's the height of stuff above water level. So that's water level, and here it's seeing one bank of the, da of the dam, and here is the other bank of the dam as a, as a 3D point cloud. So when it's close to the shore, it can map the three-dimensional structure of, of what's around it. The other thing you can do is these uh, automate, automatic transects, so we can do this big wiggly pattern. I think that's little meringue, uh, and with a sonar sensor on the bottom, it can pull out the bathymetry. Uh, so you can do a bathymetric survey with a robot, just just goes backwards and forwards, do it every month, every week, how often, how ever often you want. It's also been doing some methane emission surveys, which are interesting. So measuring methane coming up from the water. And found some quite interesting patterns about you know, where the methane's been generated from, typically in the arms, and typically more in the mornings and the afternoons uh, than in the middle of the day. So you can actually do some you know, greenhouse gas accounting. And most people are not patient to go and measure the methane over a whole over a whole water storage many times a day. That's a good thing for a robot to do. You just send it endlessly going back and forth over storage. By measuring stuff, you'll find patterns that you would never see if you send a guy out in a boat. You know, every six months. You know, these patterns are happening daily and they vary across the water storage. So that's the sort of thing that a robot can do for you. Uh, this is what Matt's doing now. He's got this uh, bunch of uh, solar powered water sampling boats 